All right, let's talk cancer, folks. So clearly, this is going to be a conversation about cancer. So prepare your butt. <laughs> um, Saturday, August nineteenth is the one year anniversary of me getting diagnosed. It was August nineteenth, twenty twenty two, when I got diagnosed with cancer, stage three. Now, a little history leading up to that. Um, fall of twenty twenty. I started experiencing spotting blood when I went to the bathroom um, because it was 2020 and there was just craziness everywhere. Um, I chalked it up to stress because I'm stupid. I'm 48, but I just haven't learned. <laughs> so I just was like, whatever. I was being dumb. Um, and then it kind of progressed a little bit sometimes. It would go away a little bit sometimes. Um my stomach was always kind of bugging me, like, you know, like bathroom issues and stuff like that. And then uh, early 2022, by like January, uh, the blood was getting pretty severe. And I thought I had Crohn's because I was constantly going to the bathroom. Um, by this point in time, I couldn't do my like normal job anymore. So I was off. So I was having to work from home kind of thing. Self-employed. So and, um, but it got to the point where I couldn't do anything. Like I just couldn't function. Like I just, I couldn't go anywhere because I always had to be near a bathroom. So, um, February, I finally got into the walk-in clinic because at that point in time in Canada, in my part in Canada, doctors were very scarce in 2022. It was very hard to get into doctors. I was on a waiting list for like three years to get a family doctor. Um, cause I never got sick before. I was never, I'd never been sick really my entire life. I never had measles growing up or like chicken pox or anything like that. I was very active. Um, I've been very active my entire life. Like I cycle constantly while well, I used to, um, I used to commute by bike and see sorry, throat. Um, I never got sick. I just never got sick. So I never had the family doctor. So you know, what can you do? But anyways, regardless, um, Went into a walk-in, saw a lady. Um, she's like, okay, well, you know, I'll, I'll get some blood work done and, uh, and we'll go from there. I'm like, all right. So go and get blood work done. Um, go back to her. And um, she's like, well, it's not cancer. And I was like, really? I'm like, oh, okay, great. I'm like, I don't know how you can determine that from blood, but all right. Um, it's the CA level. I know that now. So she says it's not cancer. I'm like, well, what is it then? Like, you know, like, what are we doing here? I'm like, I'm, I can't live like this. Like at this point, the blood was getting bad. Like it was really bad. Every time I went to the bathroom, there was blood. The bowl was red. And so she's like, well, let me check your prostate. So, you know, it's not bend over anymore for checking your prostate. It's curl up in the fetal position. Then, you know, she shoves her finger up your butt or he, whatever your doctor is. Um, which was fun. And then, <laughs> so she's like, well, your prostate feels fine. I'm like, okay, well, that's good because prostate cancer is terrifying, right? Um, so she's like, well, I'm going to schedule you for a uh, colonoscopy. I'm like, okay. So because of the state of the medical system in Canada at that point in time, I didn't get my colonoscopy until August 19th. And thankfully, I got the doctor I did because she is freaking awesome. Super nice. Um, we were joking around ahead of time going into it because I'm a pretty easygoing guy. I crack jokes all the time. It's just my nature. It's also how I deflect from people knowing how dark um, my brain is kind of thing, like depression and stuff like that. So I just crack jokes. I just try to keep the room light kind of thing. Oh, shout out to my shirt. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so yeah, I'm like, okay, well, I told her what was going on and she's like, okay, this isn't good. I'm really glad you're here. I'm like, yeah, you know, let's get this figured out. She's like, well, considering how much blood you have, and she's like, I'm, we're going to gas you. I'm like, well, you know, knock you out. I'm like, okay, hey, that's fine, whatever. And the hospital I was in for that first one. It was like brand new, state of the art. It's gotten a lot of money put into it for its cancer care and, and surgery department, stuff like that. So when I first walked in, there was like, I swear they're AK monitors, but it was like beautiful monitor setup. I was like, holy crap, man. I love this setup. Like I'm just geeking out because I'm a dork, right? So um, 
as you can tell by all the electronic crap. Um, so we were laughing about that. I'm like, man, you're going to get a really clear shot of my butt. And she's like, yeah, that's the point. I'm like, yeah, I guess so. So, you know, we we're joking, having a, you know, just light and easy and stuff like that. And I ended up waking up in the middle of her, you know, checking on my butt because she hit it. She hit something. And, um, she was trying to get by it, but she couldn't. So I was waking up because I was like, holy crap, what the hell are you doing down there? Like, it was really uncomfortable. And I looked at the monitor and I was like, what is that? And she's like, that's cancer. I'm like, juice me up, put me back out. I didn't want to be awake for her poking around and seeing what the hell was going on. I'm like, oh, just put me out, you know, because it was black and angry looking like, um, I'm not going to show you pictures of that. I am going to put up pictures every once in a while in this corner over here of like, you know, before me ahead of time, like before I lost weight and, you know, like in the hospital and stuff like that. Just a couple, just for context. So come out of surgery uh, in the waiting area. So she comes out after doing another colonoscopy. Wham, bam, thank you, you know, you know, kind of thing. She was churning through us like crazy. She did four people before she saw me. Like, it was just like, bang, 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 bang. Like, it's just so crazy up here for medical. And um, so she comes out and she's like, you know, she's got the look. And I'm like, oh, how bad is this? She's like, well, it's bad. Like, we need to get this taken out of you, like, right away. I'm like, no chemo first? She's like, no, you, you need surgery, like, right away. And I'm like, okay, well, that's pretty bad sounding. She said it's big. And I'm like, all right. I'm like, what are we talking here? Like stage three, stage four? She's like, I don't know. We don't know that until we actually get in and see how much. She's like, you're going to go for a CT to see if it's spread to other parts of your body just because it is, it's big. So it, it could have spread. I'm like, okay. So that was that. Okay, leave. <clears throat> and then um, CT scan was on September 1st. And then I went back to see her on the 9th. Sorry, just checking my cheat sheet here. On the 9th, <clears throat> CT scan came back negative for lungs and liver and stuff like that, which was good. Um, but the tumor was big because you can, like CT scan doesn't show the inside of hollow things. So you can't see inside your colon with a CT scan, but you can see the surrounding tissues outside of it. Um, for inside your colon and stuff like that, that's why they use cameras because CT just doesn't work. But they could tell from the outside that it was big. Like, this was a big tumor. So, she's like, um, this thing's pretty big. I'm like, okay. So, she was concerned that I would stop being able to go to the bathroom because the tumor was so big and it was blocking my colon. Because my, one of the, my bowel movements at this time were like, just toothpaste coming out. Like, there was nothing solid at all. Like, it was horrible. And I was going all the damn time because it was such a backlog because everything was hitting this tumor and it couldn't go anywhere. <clears throat> Sorry. So she was worried I wasn't going to make my surgery. So she actually recommended that I go into the hospital and go on call and sit there, which could have taken a week of me sitting in a hospital waiting for a surgeon to open up now the problem with that is one i don't do hospital <laughs> um and it would have been like i would have been in a bed in a hallway or something stupid like that because the state of the system here is just ridiculous and two there's a good chance you're gonna get somebody who's been on for like 20 hours and they just had a cancellation or something like that i'm like no i'm like you are my doctor you are my surgeon what do i got to do to get in to see you she said, you need to go really light on your diet. So in other words, no fiber, like nothing at all that can cause blockage, right? Like she didn't want me getting constipated at all. So I basically went on like a extreme diet. For five weeks, all I did was drink Boost and Ensure, and that was it. And four bottles a day. That was it. Because... I was terrified of my colon bursting and I did not want to go in for emergency surgery because if I would have went in for emergency surgery, they would have given me a colonoscopy bag and I didn't want to be bagged. Was the last thing I wanted was to come out of surgery with a bag. I was terrified of coming out bagged just because I'm so active. The idea of being able to hold a bag against me as I'm riding my bike just didn't work for me. Like it just, you know, it wasn't a thing that I thought I could do. 
so surgery was October 17th, which is the day before my birthday. And people said to me, coming up to my birthday, like, what do you want for your birthday? I was like, I don't want anything. I'm like, I want surgery. And then I got the call like the ninth or something. It was like a week away from the date. And they said, can you make it for the 17th? I'm like, I'll make it tomorrow if you want me to. Like, I'm already prepping. Like, I just need to do the like the bowel prep thing. So did another round of the bowel prep. So the 17th rolls around, surgery was 7 a.m., nice, bright and early. And uh, the nurse who was taking care of me in there, super nice. Everybody in that same hospital that I had my colonoscopy at. Um, everybody was awesome, like super good people, like really took care of me and stuff like that. Very nice and, um, you know, chatting and stuff like that. And, you know, it was really a good experience. And so the anesthesiologist comes walking in and she's got a young lady with her. And she said, um, do you mind if she's in the surgery? I'm like, I don't care. I'm like, everybody starts somewhere. She's like, okay. I'm like, well, hang on a second. <laughs> I'm like, is she going to be in charge of gassing me or are you going to be in charge of gassing me? She's like, no, no, I'll do the gassing. I'm like, oh, okay. I'm like, no offense, but it's your first day, you know? So, so I had another new person there. So they wheel me into the hospital room, into the operating room. There's my surgeon, my doctor. You know, we're chatting and she's like, holy crap, you've lost weight. And I was like, yeah. She's like, how much you've lost? I'm like, at least 25 pounds. She was like, oh, crap. you really wanted to get in to see me. And I'm like, yeah, I wasn't kidding. Like, I wanted to see you as my surgeon. And um, so again, we're laughing and having a good time. I was like, I'm like, man, whatever you got to do, doc. I'm like, just, you know, I don't want to wake up to a bag. That's my thing. That was my only thing. I didn't want to wake up to a bag. Um. She's like, well, I'll do what I can, but I can't promise anything. And they were going to do the surgery laparoscopically. So you put a couple of holes in, you blow up the stomach with air, and then you yank it out and cut a small slit and yank it out. The upside of that is the recovery is like substantially better. She's like, you could probably be out in like three days if we do, if it's successful laparoscopically. I'm like, okay. She said, but there's a chance we're going to have to cut you open because of the size of the tumor. I'm like, yeah, okay, that's fine. And, um, so we were joking around and stuff like that. And I was like, okay, well, what are we listening to for music? I'm like, cause I don't want to be gassed out. And you guys are listening to like Justin Bieber or something like that. <laughs> and I said, last time you guys had smooth jazz going, I'm like, if you're going to gut me open, like do some smooth jazz or something, you know, nice, nice and peaceful. So we we're laughing, having a good time, you know? So surgery, blah, blah, blah. So I wake up and, um, I come to as they're wheeling me into, um, my room. I guess I was in and out of it before then, but I don't remember. Like, I don't remember much of that first day. Um, my partner was there, so she was telling me everybody that was coming in because she was there the whole time. And um, so the anesthesiologist, she came in with her with her, uh, with her her trainee, and she just woke me up. She's just like, Mike, you know, wake up, because she's trying to get me to come around and, you know, see how I'm doing. And I woke up, and I was like, how'd it go? She said, no bag. And I'm like, oh. Thank the Lord for that one. Cause she knew I wanted no bag. Like she was, I was having it with her too. I'm like, do whatever you guys can, you know? And so then, um, yeah, they ended up having to gut me open. When I say gut me open, I mean like, you know, do the big incision. So she started in my belly button, which to me still freaks me out that she went right through my belly button. I don't know why, but you know, my belly button's cut open. So through my belly button and then probably like, two inches above my um, my groin. So a pretty big, you know, incision. And then I still had the two pilot holes from when she did the laparoscopic. She started it, but she's, as soon as she blew me up and put the camera in, she's like, there's no way we can do this because it's too big. So that was the first night. She came by later on. I want to say about 10 o'clock at night she came by. And luckily by that point, I was awake and sort of, you know, around... I was like, what are you doing here still? Like you, you did, you cut me open at 7 a.m. Like, why are you still here? And because of the state of our medical system, she was then on call all night long for emergency surgeries in, in the ER, which is what I was terrified of for me going in on an emergency. I mean, whoever went in was be thankful because she was awesome. So she would take good care of them. So that was day one. <clears throat> that was my first day in, in the hospital and, it was very uneventful. I puked because, you know, the gas, stuff like that, the anesthetic. And then the next day is when the fun began. So 
I'm not going to go into, we'll talk about the hospital stay. That's what we'll do. We'll break this up into segments. So the hospital stay. If you're going through cancer and you're going to stay in the hospital, here's some tips for you, okay? If you do not normally drink anything with a straw, prepare your butt because, well, up here anyways, they give you a big jug of water and it's got a straw in it. Well, the problem with that is if you don't normally drink through a straw, and suddenly you're drinking all day long through a straw, what happens? You gas up. So they're trying to get you to move things through your bowel. Gas. They're constantly coming in. Have you farted? Have you passed gas? Have you passed gas? Have you passed gas? No, 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 no. Because they want to know your colon's moving. Um, you're getting a booster insurer, a soup, um, jello, tea. That's it. That's what you get for until they know that you're like passing gas. Once you're passing gas, then they will bring you food. Well, I wasn't passing gas because the problem was I was bloating so bad. I was just burping the entire time. My colon wasn't working. It was like, no, we're done. We're not doing anything. You ripped this apart. We're not doing it. And so I gassed up horribly and I started puking. Like I was getting very nauseous all the time. And it wasn't just from the from the drip, from the pain pill, from the pain meds or anything like that. I was just constantly nauseous and puking. So they had to tube me. They had to put a tube in and drain out the gas, which was the worst freaking thing. Like it was so bad because up until that point, I was up and walking around and stuff like that. And then they tube me and then that was it. I was locked in bed and it broke me. Like it literally broke me mentally. Um, for three days, four days, I was tubed. Like I should have been home by now, but instead Friday night, I'm getting tubed. And so Friday morning, sorry. I'm getting tubed. And then before that, of course, because nothing's working for me. Like my body just shut down completely. I hadn't gone pee. So, (laughs) so the Thursday afternoon, now I've been in there since Monday. By Thursday, they were like, hey, we got to do something because you have to pee. I'm like, well, I don't like peeing in crowds. And there was three other people in my room. And, um, so like, hey, well, we're going to have to put a catheter in. I'm like, oh, son of a bitch. Like, I don't want to go through this again. So she's like, well, we'll just run a line in and see if we can, you know, you know, break the seal kind of thing. I'm like, all right. So the older nurse is there. And who does she have? A new girl. <laughs> All told from the time I did my first blood work and stuff like that till I'm up to date now, I've had 12 people that it was their first day doing something. Either blood, which was many, many times I've had people in their first day. Uh, the anesthesiologist, numerous nurses going through the hospital because they were so desperate, were so short staffed up here in Canada at that time that they were literally taking kids like three months of schooling and bringing them in just to help out, which is fine. Like, I don't care. Like, you know, they weren't having to do anything to me that they were going to kill me, you know, kind of thing. So, so the girl doing, you know, putting in the, um, the catheter was her first day. I'm like, all right, well, fun (laughs) so they put it in and yeah i just it was like a garden hose cracking open like i was like oh my god it was so much relief so yeah my body just like was shut down like it was like yeah we're not having anything to do with working properly right now after surgery and um so yeah they had to tube me that was until monday morning And then that came out, and then by that point, I was passing gas, and I was, like, you know, having bowel movements, but, you know, they weren't very good because I wasn't really eating anything. So then they were like, okay, well, we'll take the two boat. I'm like, and I first thing I did, I went for a walk. I just went out and walked around, and I went outside for a bit and got some fresh air and just, you know, tried to get back to myself kind of thing. And so I got back up and they had lunch there sitting for me and it was like microwave French fries and microwave chicken fingers. And I was like, I am not eating this crap. Like, because I was normally a healthy eater. Like that's the rub of me getting cancer. Um, I ate healthy. Like I was fit. I was in good shape. I never got sick. Like, you know, we ate kale and spinach and asparagus and, and, um, And stuff like that, arugula, and like we always eating greens with every meal. I was taking super green supplements and stuff like that. 
And so ending up in the hospital and then eating hospital food is like, I am not doing this. Like, I'm not. So I went down and they had a nice restaurant downstairs on the main floor and they were making good meals. I'm like, I'm going to go eat that crap. So I went downstairs, paid for my own stuff. I don't care. I'm like, I'm not eating that. Because it's not going to make me better. It's going to make me worse. I know it is. And so I wasn't allowed to leave the hospital until the 26th. So I was in for nine days. I should have been three days. <laughs> but my body was just like, no. So, <clears throat> yeah, when you're in there, do not drink anything out of the straw because it's going to mess up your your bowels and how you function and your stomach too. You're going to gas up. And then on top of that, have people you or have people bring you stuff that you would normally eat or drink because you trying to recover from surgery and then you doing, you know, eating all this and drinking all this stuff that you don't normally do is not going to make you better. It's not because it's not your normal stuff. It's the cheapest thing for them to give you just to make a budget. Now, up here in my part of Canada, the daily allotted budget per person in the hospital for food is $26. That includes the staff in order to pay, paying the staff in order to bring the food around. So when you break it down, you're getting about $6 worth of food. <laughs> it's not good. Like, it's not good. So have people bring you stuff. Like, you can do that. It's fine. Get them to bring you stuff. Because by that point, I was getting people to bring me like orange juice and and bottled water and um, and Gatorades and stuff like that so I can get electrolytes and get my, my body back to normal and like, you know, um, proper food and everything like that. Because holy crackers, they're trying to help you, but at the same time, I don't know, maybe it's different in other parts of the other world or in, in Canada maybe, but in my part in Canada... The people were awesome, but man, the food was horrendous. It was not going to make me any better. So anyways, that was, you know, it wasn't very fun in the hospital. And then the other reason why my body wasn't working is because she took out 23 centimeters of my colon and rectum because where my cancer, my tumor was, it was right where the um, sigmoid colon meets the rectum. It was right at that junction. So she took out like half of my rectum and then like, you know, a whole whack of my sigmoid colon. Um, so the problem with that is those things will, you know, regrow and not regrow, but figure out how to work again properly. It takes time. It takes a long time. And they were trying to get me to have a bowel movement in three days when my rectum is like half of what it used to be because the rectum is where everything gets turned into. Like that's the part that actually pushes your your bowel movement out kind of thing. Um, and so my body was like, no, I'm like, I'm broken. I don't know what to do. And to this day, I'm still, it's been a year and it's still, I have a very hard time with bowel movements. Um, it can take two years. There's some things, there's some side effects that you just might not recover from. Um, let's talk chemotherapy. So chemotherapy for me started on November 21st of 2022. It went until May 30th of 2023. Now my head oncologist, because here you get the, like a team. So there's your head oncologist there's your FPO, which is your family practitioner or something or other. But he's like, he's a doctor, 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 or she. And then you get a dedicated nurse and a dedicated clerk. So the three people that you see all the time are the clerk, the nurse, and the FPO. And then he sends all his information to the head oncologist, to your surgeon, and then to your family doctor too. Because by this point, I had gotten a family doctor. Um, so chemo... The 21st November started and my head oncologist wanted me to do oral chemotherapy. And I'm like, really? I'm like, I never even knew that was a thing. I'm like, okay. Because of my age and this cancer, and there's no history in my family of, of colon cancer. Nobody's had colon cancer in my family. Both sides too. Like, it's just not a thing. Like her, her family's pretty lucky with certain things. Um, and because I'm young too, for having this cancer, um, he was worried because, um, you know, I'm only 48 and I've already got a very aggressive cancer and very large cancer. 
Um, she pulled out 28 lymph nodes. Now, how they rate the staging system, I'm not going to get into any details of it, but there's stage one, two, three, and four. And within those, there's also like um, A, B, and C kind of thing. But um, stage three can be stage three without it being into um, lymph nodes or other parts of the body. A lot of parts of the body is stage four, but it can be stage three with its own lymph nodes, depending on the size of the tumor. And because mine was so big, um, it was classified as stage three. So he wanted to do oral chemotherapy. I'm like, okay, well, whatever. And I'm like, well, what are the side effects of oral compared to, to um, IV going in for the for the IV chemotherapy? Now, keep in mind, at this point, I had started growing. I had grown my hair out because I was going to donate it to cancer, and then I got cancer, which is hilarious. I was going to donate it to cancer survivors. And so I was like, well, I guess I should shave my head because I'm going to lose my hair. He said, no, you won't lose your hair with this one. I'm like, really? I'm like, okay, that's weird. I ended up did losing my hair. Like it started thinning out in front. So I just shaved my head anyways. I, I clipped it off and I sent it away. Um, so the side effects are different. So with the IV one, the big kicker is like you get sick, like nauseous and stuff like that. But you go in once every two weeks for like three days, you get juiced and then you're back to your normal life. Well, the oral one, I was taking 5,000 units of chemotherapy every day. So it's two weeks on, one week off. So you take 2,500 in the morning and 2,500 at night. You do two weeks on, one week off for your body to recover. It doesn't recover. And then you go for blood work. For me, it was the Wednesday I went for blood work at the same hospital that I was getting going to see my cancer team. So it just got sent down the hall. And then the Thursday I went to talk to my FPO and my nurse about what had, how things were going for that last round of, of poison pills. I call them poison pills. Um, my head oncologist got really butthurt when I called them that. And I'm like, well, they're poisoning my body, dude. Like <laughs> you're putting chemicals into me to kill things inside my body and kill my body. It's poison. Like, I'm sorry, but I call them my poison pills. Um, <clears throat> so the... God, I'm not going to remember the name of it. Anyways, epicetamine or something like that. Um, Maybe I'll put it up on the screen in writing or something like that. The side effects for that were, for me, and I was getting stuff that my family, the doctor, my cancer doctor, and he'd been a doctor for a very long time. He'd been in cancer stuff for 15 years. So he'd seen a lot of stuff. He was like, man, you are getting the really bad end of this deal. Like, I was getting stuff that even he was like, he's like, I've never seen somebody have this or at this level. Now, keep in mind, up until cancer, I'd had a bad concussion in 2019. But other than that, I'd never been sick, right? I've never, I never even got like cold, ammonia, flu, nothing like that. Um... I didn't have to take pills or medications or anything like that. So my body was pretty clean. I didn't drink. I've never smoked in my life. Um, drugs, recreational drugs. I dabbled a little bit for a couple of years, 2005 to 2007. Well, a little bit, a little bit. Other than that, like I didn't really do anything. Like I was just a clean guy, like, you know. So suddenly now introducing these pills into my body, my body went into fits, like absolute fits. I'm still dealing with it to this day. And it's like two months, three months post chemo. Um, so we'll go through them in order. <clears throat> so if you are taking oral chemotherapy, this is what I had to deal with. Hands and feet. So you develop hand and foot syndrome. Um, what that means is your hands and feet will swell up incredibly painful and they will dry and crack and bleed. Fingerprints are gone. So if you ever want to rub a bank, you're fine. <laughs> I still have no fingerprints, um, which most people don't realize your fingerprints are how you hold things. It's not your hand strength. It's your fingerprints. That's how you grip. I've dropped more crap in the last 10 months than I ever have in my entire life combined. And it's so frustrating for me because I hate dropping things. Anyways, so 
hand and foot syndrome, you lose your fingerprints and hand and foot syndrome was bad. Like I went through about $300 in different prescription creams, over the counter stuff, um, like a million different ways to try to fight it so I could still use my hands and so I could walk because I couldn't walk. Like there was about three weeks there where I legit couldn't walk. It killed me walking around. In the house, I had to wear um, runners and really good cushion runners too because just walking around in the house was excruciatingly painful. <clears throat> That was like, initially, that was the big one. I'm like, holy crap, this really sucks. And it throws your bowels and your stomach through fits. Absolute fits. You go from like excruciating diarrhea. So you're like, I need to take something because I can't function. So I would take an Imodium. And then I'm constipated for five days. And then the pain from that constipation was excruciating. So your bowels are in this constant like up and down of going too much and then not going at all. Like, I mean, not at all, like not even like a little rabbit poop kind of thing. So you got the hand and foot syndrome. You got the bowels that are getting absolutely destroyed. And then the real beauty one, well, there's two. There's one, eyes. My eyes, like right now, my eyes are killing me. And I'm probably going to be wiping my eyes with Kleenex once in a while um, because they're tearing up like crazy. My eyes now are so bad, like... Light is light sensitivity is unbelievable. Pain, watering, like I'm always it always looks like I'm crying. Like I, I stop to start talking to people and I immediately say, I'm not crying. I'm like going through something with my eyes because my eyes will just start tearing and I look like I'm having a you know a meltdown or something. <clears throat> um the eyes were really bad. Like the eyes have been a hard one because like you, you can't see it's it's really difficult and i mean you can't go outside because the light's so bad and here in canada like at that point we're going through winter so snow blind is a legit thing here in my part of canada so being outside in the snow with the sun bouncing off of it it was excruciating like absolutely excruciating i bought ski goggles just so i could walk around because any kind of wind hitting it too would just like aggravate them like crazy. It was a brutal winter. Like it was probably the worst winter I've ever had to deal with. And then the real big one that I got, which really kind of rattled a few people and it actually made them stop my chemotherapy. And then we ended up reducing my dosage from 5,000 to 4,000 units a day. Was I got a skin condition called balanitis. This is something that affects the male scrotum. And for me, it was basically like having an open wound um, at the end of my scrotum. So comfort you can forget about because it was constantly an open wound and it was like, it was the entire part of it. So there's no way to get comfortable. There's just nothing. There's nothing you can do. I bought boxer shorts to just try to do that. Doesn't work. Sleeping was ridiculous. Forget about it. So for five weeks, we tried everything to calm this down. Because I started getting it. I think I was into my second round of poison pills. And you got to remember, I was supposed to do eight. So it was supposed to be two weeks on, one week off for eight cycles. And I'm only two into it. And I'm already developed this. So by the third cycle, I was like really bad. Like I had like three different doctors coming in and looking at it and they were like, holy crap, like this is bad. I'm like, yeah, I know, man. Like I really don't want to keep going like this. Like I wanted to stop altogether because life was not good. Like it wasn't good at all. Um, you can forget about being intimate with somebody because there's just no way. Like it's just impossible. Um. So yeah, it was like, it was brutal, like absolutely brutal. I still have scarring down there from how badly my body was affected by the poison pills. Um, it's not substantial scarring. Like I can see it. The spouse, she can't, but I can because I'm, I look at it all the time, you know? So yeah, like. 
I told my doctors flat out, either we do something or else I am not, I'm not going to keep doing this. And I wanted to go on IV because the, clearly the poison pills were not agreeing with my body. So he contacted my head oncologist and he was like, nope, he's got to stay on the pills. Like, you know, son of a bitch, man. Like I was mad. I was really angry. And I was like, dude, what do you want me to do? Like I was talking to my doctor who I got along really well with. Like he was super good, like really nice. The nurse too, she was really good. He was like, I don't want you to stop. We're going to cut back the dose and see what happens, but we're going to give you a break. And I'm like, all right. So they gave me a break for a month. And so at the end of the month, my hands were better-ish. My eyes were still really bad, but the issues on my scrotum had cleared up. Um, so like, hey, we're going to start back up. We're going to go to 4,000. I'm like, all right. He said, but if that doesn't work, then we'll drop it down. And I'm like, okay. I was like, as long as the thing doesn't come back on my scrotum, that's the main thing for me. I didn't want to deal with that again because I just wouldn't. Like, it just, life was not fun. And, um... So yeah, we went back on the pills and the rest of the ride, it was just the hands and the eyes. It never came back to my scrotum, thankfully. But, you know, it's two months later now, three months later now, and I'm still dealing with it. Um, my eyes are still bad. Uh, my hands are okay. My feet are okay. So I can walk and function and everything like that. Um, I do get a weird random like tingling sensation and my left hand goes numb for no reason. Nobody's worried about it. So I'm like, okay, whatever. <laughs> Nobody seems to care. Um, I'm still getting blood in my stool. It's been constant. Um, they did actually try doing a colonoscopy in the middle of my uh, chemotherapy. I think it was like, um, I want to say mid-April because I was having really bad blood, like blood bowl bad. And... Um, it just didn't work because my colon wouldn't clear out because it's broken, right? So it's just not going to work. So it was a waste of time. And, um, yeah, so I'm still having issues. So there's concern now because when she did my first colonoscopy on August 19th of 2022, the tumor was so big, she couldn't actually get past it to see the rest of my colon. So we don't know what's going on in the rest of those 30 miles, whatever it is of colon. Um, so there's a lot of area for stuff to be bad if I've got a tumor that big, that far down. So there could be something else going on because my CEA levels are still high. Um, so yeah, August 28th. So in a week from now, like 10 days from now, I go in for a colonoscopy again with my main surgeon. And uh, hopefully this comes back with everything negative. Um, I'm still having issues. I still have other stuff going on as far as like, you know, not feeling well and stuff like that. Run down, brutally run down. Um, so there is some concern that there could be something going on. I'm having a lot of issues with my eyes and uh, with my head and stuff like that. So we're going to go and get the head scanned at some point. I'm waiting. There's no idea when. Just to rule out a brain tumor kind of thing too. So because of my age and this cancer, they're worried that I'll have a tumor somewhere else kind of thing. But yeah, um, all I have to say is if you go on chemotherapy, be very careful if you take the oral chemotherapy um, for lotion and for body washes because you got to wash, like you have to be super careful with your hands and your feet and stuff like that. I tried everything. I mean, literally everything. I spent hundreds of dollars trying stuff. The two things that worked really well and God bless Jennifer Aniston and her commercials. Whereas Avino's uh, regenerative therapy line, whatever it is, Avino as a line was developed for cancer patients. Um, I'll put a picture up of the bottle right there. Maybe I will. I don't know. I forget. Anyways, they develop a line for cancer patients. It's a lotion and a body wash. And holy crap, those two things worked so good. They were so good. Like it worked better than any prescriptions crap that they gave me. So, yeah, the Aveno restorative line, or restorative therapy line, I believe it's called. Um, it's so good. The lotion was like $15 Canadian for a smaller bottle. The same thing with the body wash, but holy crap, money well spent. And they, the lotion lasts so long, like I still got a bottle of it. It's just like you don't need very much of it, and holy crap, it's so good. So let's talk about the mental battle. 
If you're watching this and you're going through cancer, I feel for you. And if you can find somebody that you can talk to, do it as soon as you get diagnosed. Because, like, I'm a very stoic dude normally. People don't know what's going on with me normally. Like, I don't share. Um, I just say, they're like, how's it going? No, it's okay. You know, I was born in 1974. It's a typical Gen X response to everything. Um, it's okay. You know, this is just how our generation is. Like, you don't really share, you know, it's just, um, it's a bad one. Like, it's not smart. It's a stupid way to live. You need to talk to a counselor, a therapist, a psychologist, get your doctor to recommend somebody, somebody that either specializes in this or find an outreach program with cancer survivors to talk to. Because this is going to throw your world completely upside down. Because there's parts of this that I wasn't prepared for. Because you go through a grieving process, which sounds ridiculous, but you do. Um, because it's loss. You lose so much of who you are, like so much of who you are. I used to ride my bike every day, mountain bike, bicycle, whatever you want to call it, every day. And on the weekends, I would go for my bring the pain rides, which are usually like 80 kilometers in length each day for like four hours a day. From like summer of 2021 up until just this year, I've gone for like two short bike rides. I couldn't ride my bike because I couldn't trust my body. So I lost that. Um, I lost the ability to do my job properly. So I lost my job. Um, going through chemotherapy because I was having such a hard time with it. I couldn't see people because COVID was still a thing when I was going through chemo. So I couldn't go and visit my family. So I lost that. Christmas, I didn't do Christmas because I couldn't trust anybody because I was so worried. There are so many parts of loss that they don't tell you to prepare for that it's mind-blowing how much this messes you up mentally. There are some people find that they can skate through it and God bless them. Like, but if you're one of those people who's, you know, has mental struggles going into it, and I did, still do, um, you need to get somebody as soon as you are diagnosed. Don't wait until your surgery. Don't wait until you're going through chemotherapy because by then things are going to be compounded because now you've got the loss of whatever they've taken out of you because it's weird, but there's a weird violation to going through surgery and knowing they've taken out parts of your body. I don't understand why I had those feelings, but they happened. <laughs> like somebody's taken something from you. Like it's such a weird one. Like, you know, you went in one morning, you come out and there's a whole section of you that's no longer a part of you and your body's completely different. And it is, my body's completely different now. So, there's a huge loss aspect and a grieving aspect because you're grieving for yourself because you've lost so much of who you are as a person. Because from that point on, whenever people talk to you, it's, oh, and it's fine. People come up to you and I want to do that. But the whole, that from that point on, your life is, how are things going with your cancer? How's the cancer? How's the chemo? How are you feeling? How's this? You get bombarded with people, good caring people, that ask you these questions over and over. So you cannot turn it off. You can't turn your brain off about what you're going through because you're just not allowed because everybody else around you is hyper-focused on you now because of what you're going through. And so it's always like, do you need anything? Do you want anything? And for somebody like me who never like reached out to anybody for anything, it's overbearing. Like it was over, it was overwhelming. Like I had to tell people, just stop. Like, please, I'll let you know if I need something, but I love you. Just stop. <laughs> You know what I mean? Like, <clears throat> so you need to talk to somebody. You need to get somebody in place, a grief counselor, or like I said, find an outreach program, a volunteer service, an online something, anything with cancer survivors. Um, or if you're watching this and leave a comment down below and I'll get back to you. Um, I'd love for the comment section on this video to be just a nice, conversation where people can talk to each other and help each other because 
man, your family's not going to understand unless somebody's gone through cancer. But even then, because it's different. My mom went through cancer. She never had, she went two, two rounds of breast cancer. She never had any issues because she just did radiation. Um, surgery, she was in and out in like a day. And so it's not, every cancer is different and every cancer story is different. So talking to people about cancer, yeah, it's, it's good. It helps a lot. But you're not going to have the same thing. They'll understand what you're going through because they'll have something that's similar to what you've gone through. But everybody's journey is unique. And that's the worst part about cancer is because there's no blueprint on what to do. There's no blueprint on what symptoms person A, B, C, or D is going to get. There's nothing. They can go, well, here's what you can get. But you're going to get stuff that's not even on that list like I did. Um the most important thing is to get yourself a support system in place as soon as you're diagnosed. Get it in place because you're going to need it. And you're going to have to lean on it. Because if you try to go it alone, it will break you. And I say that because I've gone through it and it broke me. Um, because it's just, it's brutal. Like, and again, there's some people that can just go through it and they're fine. And it's like, God bless you. Like, I don't know how you did it, but God bless you. Um, Because you always see those uplifting and motivational YouTube videos and stuff like that. And it's like, okay, that's awesome. (laughs) But that's not my situation. So, like, if you're one of those few percentage of people that can go through it and you're like that, then, you know, fair play to you. But I don't think most people are going to have that kind of journey. And everybody I've talked to so far, they're not having that journey. So, yeah. Get a support system in place and do everything you can to try to retain who you are. So if you're passionate about reading and your eyes go bad, audiobooks. If you're passionate about anything, find a way to still do it or find new things to be able to do because this is going to tear your world apart. And... If you're in a relationship, your spouse is going to have no idea of what's going on because they can't, right? They can't know because they're not going through it. They see you going through it. You might tell them what's going on. You might not tell them everything that's going on because if you told them everything that's going on, people would get you committed because if your mind goes dark, it goes dark. Like I'm saying dark, dark. So the number one thing I can tell you right now is get a support system in place. Now, if you are watching this and you know somebody going through cancer, don't bombard them with questions or trying to give them things or anything like that. You just tell them flat out, if you need anything, let me know. I'm not going to bother you. It's not because I don't care, but it's because I don't want to bother you. But if you need anything at any point in time, you let me know and I will do it. And that'll be the best thing for them to know. And for you to do to them. Because they already have enough going on in their head. They don't need 50 people every day texting or calling or stopping by. Do you need anything? Do you want anything? How are you? How are you feeling? And cut them some slack if they're having a day. Or they're just like, if they don't want to talk about anything, like if they just shut down and want to go quiet, let them have that day. Because... If they feel like they constantly have to try to be normal, it's going to break them. And again, trust me on this. Uh, This is my personal knowledge of going through this crap. Um, It will break you. Because it's just so much. Like, it's it's so much. You can't prepare for everything you're going to go through when you get diagnosed with cancer, you can't. You can read everything you want about it online. Like I'm, I'm a research nut. So I did all the research on it. I was not prepared. Not even like 10th prepared. You just can't. Because it's just so much going on. So get yourself a support system. Find some people to talk to. Get it in place. Do everything you can to retain some part of who you are 
Like if you can't physically do things, just find something new that, or, you know, if something you always wanted to try because you're going to be, you know, laid up for a bit, if there's something you always wanted to try, but you didn't have the time, do it. Do it. If you wanted to paint, paint. If you wanted to write, write. If you wanted to build models, build models, puzzles, anything. Read books. Get into reading books, you know. Catch up on a TV show. You know, good TV anyways. Movies. Um, do anything you can to keep your mind from getting too dark. So what does my future hold for me? That's a good question. What I know for sure is August 28th of this year, um, colonoscopy, a CT scan at some point. Uh, I don't know when yet. Waiting on that one just to make sure that there's nothing else going on anywhere else. After that, I'm probably going to be getting colonoscopies every two years, maybe. Three at best, if I'm lucky. Um, and I'm going to have to watch what I eat. Um, like I said beforehand, I was clean. I was really clean. The only thing that I did, and this is what caused my cancer, was sugar. Now, by sugar, I mean soda. So I used to drink at least two liters of pop a day and then throw in the occasional energy drink once in a while. Um, sugar is the killer. Sugar is the one that will give you cancer. They don't tell you that. Nobody tells you that because so many industries would shut down. Like if they told you sugar gave you cancer, people would stop drinking pop. So when I got diagnosed with cancer, I started doing research on like what causes cancer because up I was healthy. Like I had no reason to get cancer and sugar kept popping up. And I was like, well, that makes a lot of sense for me. So from that point on, August 19th of last year, I went from, and I used to drink dark pop, Dr. Pepper. Dr. Pepper was my jam. I love Dr. Pepper. Um, and who knows how many grams of sugar I was taking in a day because it was that, it was energy drinks, you know. Um, I like the occasional chocolate bar and stuff like that. All of that stuff is pretty much out of my life now. Um, I allow myself either an 8-ounce glass or a can of ginger ale or Sprite or 7-Up at dinner. And in the morning, I have a glass, an 8-ounce glass of... Pure orange juice, not from concentrate, no pulp. Um, and that's it. Otherwise, I drink water. The rest of the day, I drink bottles of water. I go through them like crazy. Um, and that's it. So, sugar is the big one. So, for my future going forward, that's it. And for the last year, I went from drinking pop all the time. Like, I never drank anything else. I drank pop. To, um, literally like that's it like for dinner and that's it just because I don't like drinking water with dinner because it just I don't know it feels weird to me um, <clears throat> diet wise I'm still you know still doing how I was before you know we eat our, get our healthy greens um, extra lean meat if I eat it and yeah you know still taking my vitamins all the time taking my supplements um but my future is unknown. Nobody can tell you what your future is. Um, I have a 50-50 chance because it is stage three and how big the tumor was. Basically a 50-50 chance of it reoccurring within five years. So we'll see what happens. So my future is unknown. <laughs> it's a waiting game because it's Canada and our health system is broken. Um, it's a waiting game. And um, yeah, I just have to be very careful for the rest of my life because I'm 48 and uh, yeah, this was a bad cancer to get apparently. Everybody keeps telling me it was a bad cancer to get. Very unlucky and don't get it again. I'm like, okay. <laughs> it's not like I tried to get it in the first place. So yeah, if you're going through cancer, you know somebody going through cancer, you have all of my support. I sincerely feel for you. Um, and yeah, if you want to leave comments down below, go ahead. It'd be awesome. Either you going through it or... The funny thing is, like, I've got this shirt. <clears throat> so we'll talk a little bit about 
talking to people about cancer now. So I've become a check your butt spokesperson. I tell everybody, and I don't tell people for the sympathy. I don't tell people because I want them to feel bad for me. I tell people because I don't want them to go through this. Because the age for them checking for colon cancer in Canada is 50. And everybody I've talked to said they have to lower it to 40. Because they're getting more and more people now in their 40s with colon cancer than they ever have before. And it's becoming an epidemic. It's becoming a problem. People like 40 in their early 40s are dying from cancer, colon cancer, when they had no idea they had cancer. Um, so I've got this shirt. I've got another one that's got a little pirate character on it. It says... Uh, cancer messed with the wrong booty. And then I've got another one that says check your colon and it's a check mark and your little colon sign and stuff like that. I run into people all the time that say something about one of my shirts and I start talking to them. Um, two days ago, I was walking out of the grocery store and a guy walked by me and he said, I appreciate your shirt, brother. And I said, thanks, man. And I said, are you okay? Like, are you going through it? And he said, no, my brother died of colon cancer. And I said, I'm sorry to hear that, man. And, um, we got to talking and I was like, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm going through it myself. And he was like, really? And I'm like, yeah. He's like, wow. And I said, yeah. So I tell people all the time because I don't want anybody else to go through this. So I talked to, and it's, it's, I see anybody that's looking at my shirt and I'm like, we can talk about it if you want, because they'll read one of my shirts and they'll be like, oh, I'll see them get that look in their eye. Like, they understand or they know somebody or they're going through it or they've gone through it. And I'll just be like, Oh, did you want, did you, you know, cancer, you know, just, do you want to talk about it? Um, because I'm such an idiot and I have a hard time reaching out to, you know, professional people for help. I find it's actually easier for me to help other people. Um, by sharing part of my story, you know what I mean? So I'll do anything I can to keep people from going through this because it's horrible. You don't want to go through this, trust me. Like, I don't see how anybody who's like, oh yeah, I had some cancer, but you know, whatever. I don't know. <laughs> just don't see how that's possible. <laughs> like I said, if it is, if you had an easy time going through cancer, then God bless you. You know, more power to you. Get all the cancers if you're having an easy time with it. Um, so yeah, I'll talk to anybody. Like I've, I don't know how many conversations I've had now with random people going in and out of stores and they'll say something about my shirt or else, you know, people ask me for a smoke. I'm like, sorry, man, I don't smoke. I was like, I've never smoked, you know, but I'll let them be like, you know what the best part of that is? They're like, what? I'm like, I still got cancer. And then we'll have a laugh and, you know, and, and we'll talk about it and stuff like that. <clears throat> when I was going through chemo because I had to go into the hospital every three weeks to meet my FPO and my team and stuff like that. I'd sit in the waiting room and you can always tell when it's somebody's first time there. You can always tell. It doesn't matter how old or how young or stuff they are. And I was usually the youngest person sitting there. Um, I can always tell when it's somebody's first time. And I'd, I'd say, is this your first visit? Yeah. I'm like, are you diagnosed yet or are you finding out? And if they were finding out, I'm like, well, you know, good luck. And I hope it's something, you know, if you do have anything, I hope it's something small and they can take care of it easily kind of thing. Um, if they have found out, and they're, it's their first visit, you know, they haven't even started chemo yet. I go through the breakdown. I'm like, hey, well, this is what you need to know going into it. This is what you need to be prepared for. Um, like I said, I've become a spokesperson for check your butt. I tell everybody, check your butt. Get the at-home kit. They sell it. They just send them to you now in the mail in Canada. You just fill out a little thing online and they'll send you a kit. Check your butt. They'll check for a little tiny amount of blood in there. And if it's detected... You go to your doctor or you go to walk in and say, yeah, I've got blood in my stool. I need a colonoscopy. Boom. They'll send you away because they'd rather do that than have you in the hospital for cancer surgery because it's expensive. Um, you don't want to go through this. Trust me. <laughs> you really don't. Because <laughs> it will take away everything that you love and just throw it in the garbage. And then you're dealt with a crap hand. No pun intended for years because the recovery takes a very long time i know people that are five years out from cancer and they still have not recovered so check your butts people if you're going to take anything away from this video and my cancer story check your butt 
Tell everybody you know to check their bud. Don't go through this. That's all I have to say to you. Because it's not fun. <laughs> all right, that's it. Take care, everybody.